Welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast, the photo imaging industry's leading news source. Here's your host, Gary Peugeot. The Dead Pixel Society podcast is brought to you by Media Clip, Advertech Printing, and IP Labs. Hello again, and welcome to the Dead Pixel Society podcast. I'm your host, Gary Peugeot, and today we're joined by Caroline Peterson, the founder and chief design officer of Gallery Design Studio and founder of eShell. She's coming to us today from the metro New York area. Hi, Carolyn. How are you today? Hi, Gary. How are you? I'm doing great. First, tell us a little bit about your background as the founder of Graphic Design Studio. Yes. Yeah, so I'm the founder and chief design officer at Gallery Design Studio. Uh, it's a creative agency specialized in serving B2B technology companies. So essentially, our, our job is to simplify complex technology with visually engaging content. So mm-hmm. I've been running this business for about eight plus years now. And prior okay. to that, I worked at a publishing firm in London. And so, yeah, I've just been, uh, you know, building the business from the ground up. So when you talk about you know, visual storytelling. What what do you mean by that? Because you know, we're kind of a wash in visuals now, you know, as sort of as a culture and in marketing. But there's there's visuals that are just decorations, and then there's visuals that tell stories. What what do you mean by that? that? That's a great question. I think in specifically for what we do, it's really before we even start designing and conceptualizing, writing any sort of copy, it's really what matters to our clients, clients and audience that they're trying to target, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really, what are their needs? What are their pains? What is their better day? What does their better day look like? And so from that base, we kind of reverse engineer the copy, the design, and even the format that we choose. Okay. So, and for us, really, des- design and you know, visual storytelling is a sequence of events. It's not like this one post, like social media post, you have a video and that's it. No, it's, it's really how can you bring people from awareness to conversion, right, and making them ultimately a client by slowly sort of planting the seeds with valuable content pieces. And our secret source is, because content can take a variety of forms, our secret source lies heavily on on the visual aspect. So instead of having, for example, a long blog post, which we do, but really how we stand out is taking that long form copy and designing it into a nice report, for example, mm-hmm. or a video or a sequence of social media mm-hmm. uh, posts. Now, storytelling itself is sort of the vogue marketing thing uh, in terms of, you know, your, 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 you want to connect with the customer on an emotional level, an informational level, in a lot of different ways. More talking about the benefits rather than the features of different right. things, for example. That can be a challenge for a lot of people, to be honest, because there most people don't understand storytelling is a skill. It's not something you just naturally do. You naturally can interpret stories. You can always naturally tell stories. What are some of the things someone needs to do when they need to evaluate their strategy if they want to engage in vision and visual storytelling specifically for their business i mean look there is probably there's a lot of answers out there and i'm not pretending here to say that this is the only answer but i think well, no you're the expert you you are the expert i think an easy way uh to think about this is through examples so mm-hmm. in our case for example you know a lot of our clients are selling software and it's like well like you said you know promoting a lot of features this is like we see this heavily like well we do this and our t- software is real time and we do that and blah 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 whereas if you put it in an example just taking the same idea but just humanizing it and saying okay well paul woke up this morning signed into our software and he experienced xyz and then you know like um uh, donald miller says you also can incorporate story- storytelling elements mm-hmm. so for example you have the character which would be paul in this case then you can have a villain right which uh, in in our case the villain might not necessarily be a person it could just be a process a process right. that is so time consuming and manual that is just hindering your productivity and work right so right. we we did an example for a client and it was well paul wakes up in the morning he uses this 
And since he's been using a software, he's able to go back home and have dinner with his family. And right. so that resonates because that's a real life. You can empathize with that. You can relate to that, right? As opposed right. to this software helps you streamline your operations. Like, why would I care, right? What's in it for me? <laughs> right. Like, it's just really the simplest way is just doing an example with a real person. That That's an easy way of doing it. Because like in the photographic industry, the output industry, which we were talking about before, you know, a lot of the merchandising is not really storytelling. It's, you know, we're, we're, it's great how we can put the picture of the, the intended product on a mug in a preview. Right. But it's not really telling a story. It's not really showing how you're going to feel when you gift that to somebody, for example, or, you know, how they're going to feel looking every day at their grandchild on their coffee mug every day. Right. So that's the step that needs to be taken is what I'm saying. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think, you know, just going back into a tangible deliverable of how you can see storytelling, I think case studies are a great way of a great start to start storytelling because you're telling the story of your client. That's mm -hmm. a great start. One of the things also that I think marketers struggle with, and especially the small business owners who are who are my audience, right, is consistency across mm -hmm. platforms. Right. They may do an Instagram post. They may do a, a in-store signage. They may do, you know, videos or reels or whatever. And they don't really, they want to be trendy, but they also, but that can lead to inconsistency. Yeah. And this is something that honestly, even with larger firms, we see, we see a lot of our clients also be, um, you know, sometimes inconsistent and the name of the game is consistency is quality and <laughs> you're not going to have a strong brand. Right. If you're just doing ad hoc pieces. So the strategy that we, and this is continuously developing in, in our agency, but, you know, you have to strike that balance of quality, consistency, and speed, because unfortunately, speed is a factor. You do need to be, you know, continuously reminding your audience about your existence and the value you provide and how you can serve them. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, you don't want to be pumping out mediocrity. So because right. like you have to be very careful with your messaging, if it's resonating with your market, if the imagery you're using is is making sense. Right. So I think one strategy that that's worked, you know, that served us quite well is looking at content marketing with what we call signature pieces. So really, mm -hmm. you know, sitting down and thinking, okay, what would be a piece of content that would really move the needle for my business? So an example, you know, it depends on the stage of your business, but let's just say, for example, you know, a white paper to really showcase your expertise in the industry, right? Mm -hmm. so that's what we would call a signature piece, or maybe it's an explainer video, a two minute explainer video about your product or service. Mm -hmm. And that's a great starting point. Focus all your energy on that needle moving piece. It could also be your website if that's bringing traffic, right? Whatever it is that you think is going to bring you more traffic. And then once you have that signature content piece, extract micro content pieces from that. So similar mm -hmm. how, you know, from this podcast, for example, you could extract snippets of, you know, quotes and, and good insights, right? Similarly, you would do with video and white paper copy and mm -hmm. uh, you know, content assets. So it's really planning in advance what you're going to extract from that good piece of content, as opposed to scrambling and doing right. it because you're going to be wasting your time and, and it's a lot of wasted energy. Now, can you talk a little bit about repetition here? Because one of the things that I think a lot of people struggle with in small business marketing is, you know, let's say they do a a campaign, right? Or they're coming, you know, I want to promote holiday cards because it's the holiday season and all that. And they do it and they don't under, and they don't really consider how often it, that needs to be seen by the customer before they engage. So is there a rule of thumb on repetition or putting things in front of people, maybe in a different way with the same message? Is there, you know, how, how does that work? How, how do you make a decision? How often you run things? So I have a, a a saying that, you know, create once, distribute 10 times. Okay. 
And so, for example, you know, we do most of our designs in Figma, so uh, which is a, a design software. And what we will typically do is we have one design and we will do 10, 20 variations. Very mm -hmm. similar, you know, like following our look and feel or our client's look and feel, but doing a lot of different variations. Sure. And then just posting that. And that goes back again to those micro content pieces. They're also good mm -hmm. because they're variations of that big, thing that you did right it's a different way which then will link back to that right but it's just a different way of portraying the same thing mm -hmm. you don't want to be starting from scratch repurposing um is the name of the game mm -hmm. and that's okay right i mean it's okay to go back and revisit things can you i mean what how often can you go back to like older content is there a way to refresh that absolutely if it's relevant if it's still relevant absolutely and sometimes it just requires a copy tweak and, uh, you know, you just run with it, update, look and feel. You might, you know, your brand colors might have changed so you can, but you don't have to be starting from scratch all the time. Because I think that is one of the things that a lot of, you know, small businesses run with, right, is either they don't do much because they're, you know, it's it can be an overwhelming thing. And unless they have a service like yours or a partnership like yours or an outside agency or an in-house agency to to constantly be churning, they say they'd rather not do it, right? It's just like, okay, you know, I'll just throw the logo out there. I'll do some blog posts. I'll do some stuff. But, you know, I there's no strategy involved. Yeah. I think, honestly, whatever you do, even if you don't have the a big budget to hire a creative agency or have a freelancer help you out, I think, Whatever you do, do it consistently, mm -hmm. even if it's not, let's say, the best design. But if you have, it's again, that distribution is also a key component. Mm -hmm. You need to get in front of those eyeballs. Mm -hmm. So consistency is not just visual, but it's also like, how consistently are you going out and distributing your content? And you've got crazy tools out there now for this stuff. I mean, you mentioned Figma, there's Canva, there's Visme, there's all kinds of tools out there that are out there to to do this stuff and reformat campaigns to different platforms and things like that. So it's really easier than ever to do this. I mean, I think that's debatable. I think just because the, t the tool might be easy, like um, mm -hmm. Canva, Canva is a great tool for non-professionals. Mm -hmm. um, but you still have to go in the tool and manipulate the image, the copy. Right. I mean, yeah, even sure. if you have, you know, AI generating a lot, there still needs to be some level of human interaction. Sure. And every time you log into the application, that's, you know, it's work. Someone has to do it and someone has to do it consistently, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wasn't really talking about the AI stuff specifically, but I was just saying that, you know, uh, you know, for most casual people, you know, opening a Photoshop and resizing and getting into Adobe Premiere to cut a short video is more than they want to deal with. But, but you just mentioned AI, which is an interesting topic in and of itself because it's very trendy right now, and especially in terms of marketing. There seems to be a lot of it, you know, whether it's in, in the text world with chat GPT and now uh, with Adobe's announcements now with what they're doing, you know, they're putting it in uh, their platform. Uh, what are your thoughts on AI as a as a part of the creative marketing tool set? I think it's what you say. It's a tool. I don't mm -hmm. think it eliminates the human creativity and need. It's it's a tool. Like Figma is a tool. Like uh, Photoshop is a tool. But on the other hand, it's funny, interesting, and because I think this is just sort of like you know, it's new, it's interesting, and so there's a lot of people who perceive it as either a threat or a competition or replacement, which isn't, I agree, isn't going to happen because, uh, you know, photographers, when Photoshop first came into the marketplace, you know, it, it didn't replace photographers. It was just a, a tool photographers learned how to use. Yeah, absolutely. I think it will definitely, I mean, we leverage AI all the time uh within our agency and it's definitely helped streamline a lot of things you get a lot of great ideas mm -hmm. um, going back to the storytelling it can uh, we just drafted a script that was uh sort of like in that character mode so it definitely gives you a leg up in in, in speeding things up mm -hmm. but yeah it, it does also require heavy human proofing and quality assurance as well <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's for sure. There's some really, you, I mean, obviously it's funny. You can look at blog posts now or social media posts and you can spot the AI. I mean, that's almost a totally. game. <laughs> totally. 
<laughs> so you you didn't have a human look at this before you posted it. It's, it's very very clear. Um, and I've been guilty of that myself. So anyway, you know, one of the things you talked about was infographics and, and things like that. Um, that to me, I think is sort of an untapped marketing tool for a lot of companies. Um, why do you think that is? Um, and how can people get started? And what would be an example of a useful infographic? I think, and it's it, this is actually quite an interesting question. When I first started the agency, a lot, I would say 50% of our work was infographics. And then suddenly that took a dip and, uh, you know, videos, explainer videos, product demo videos, that became the thing and, and the main sort of focal point. Mm -hmm. But I think infographics are very powerful um, for several reasons, because you're really conveying some you know, really key information all in sort of one at once, right? And I think just having that bird's eye view mm -hmm. of, of something is really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the challenges of why I think people don't leverage infographics, I think it's uh, one, maybe people are just not thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Two, guessing the data might be uh, tough for some people. So let's say you want to do an industry report or you want to have something legitimate, you might have to outsource an external partner to do that research for you. And that can be relatively expensive. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, from a design standpoint, if you want to have it, you know, tip top professional, you know, that's also from all of the asset types that we do infographics are by far the most time consuming, I would say. Mm -hmm. Interesting, because because it, it, it's, it's an example, because the objective of an infographic is to, is to convey information simply yeah but the simpler <laughs> it is the harder it is to do and that's what the big misunderstanding is yeah it's i can imagine I can simplicity imagine. is hard <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about you know conversion and getting people to engage with content because and in, in, in a meaningful way like in a, in a way that will actually lead to sales so i think that's one of the things that there can be a disconnect in marketing where, you know, I've done all the stuff, but, you know, I've done the infographics, I've done the splinter videos, I've done the reels, I've done the instas, and I followed my brain. And I don't really have an, an objective, or I don't know how to measure the metrics of what I'm creating, right, of, of the campaign. So what comes first, the, the, the objectives or the goal or the creative? the objective and the goal before you get into any sort of creative you need to sit down and think okay what are we trying to do what is going to move my business forward what are the needle movers okay mm -hmm. it's the website this is bringing us traffic let's double down on that and then measure how many visitors we have how many clicks where do people drop off and it doesn't have to be all this fa fancy marketing lingo it can just literally be common sense like if you're doing something you know, at the end of the day, it's about revenue, right? So what are the things that lead to that revenue? Um, your visitors, if your visitors ask for more information, and then that leads into a customer, right? So you don't even need to overcomplicate it. So what are some of the ways people can measure, like you said, there's traffic, there's things, but are there other tools that people should be looking at to measure these metrics? Are there like, you know, ROI benchmarks for things like uh, social media campaigns or website campaigns or email campaigns uh, that are, you know, because that's where I think people struggle is like, you know, if they get a 3% click through on their email campaign there, is that good? I don't know. Well, that's actually pretty good if you get 3%. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Mark Cuban says, don't start a company unless it's an obsession. And if you have an exit strategy, it's not an obsession. But is obsession really the virtue to build your business on? I'm Canon Carr, and on my podcast, Business Owner Tales from the Trenches, you'll hear from business owners and entrepreneurs on what they've found to be the keys to building and sustaining success. And spoiler alert, an exit strategy is often one of those keys. Find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and businessownertales.com where we post new episodes every other Tuesday. Yeah, so I think, I mean, I know you probably won't like this answer. It depends. It depends on your industry. It depends. Right, yeah, yeah. 
for example, we're we're heavy B two B, and so our open rate on our email campaigns is low. But you know, yeah. relatively speaking, within our niche, it's it's okay. So I think it depends. Um, a good I a good I mean, it's not up to date, but a good way if you're completely starting from zero as a small business is going into Chat GPT and saying, "Hey, for my business, my niche, and a company of my size, what is a healthy benchmark?" Now, of course, you're capped to twenty twenty one, but it's it's giving you a starting point. Sure, sure. That's yeah. I mean, I thought about using Chat GPT for something like that. That's actually kind of interesting because right? I, I would have gone to like just the Google. But what would be the advantage of a Chat GPT for that? Just because it would be more of a. Well, uh, I I personally like the sort of natural language. Vibe that's that what I mean. It's kind of more conversational, right? Exactly, and I think it's a lot faster as a business owner. You don't have a lot of time, so you need you need answers quickly. Mm-hmm. And I think what it allows you to do is you can you know put in the prompt, ask the question. And if you need some nuanced variations, then you can continue chatting with it and you can get to those numbers at least for, to start with. Right. Mm -hmm. So you've also started this asset management system called eShelf. How did that come about? I mean, you've been doing your design business and uh, consulting business for about 10 years. Why would you take that on? And what is it? And why would you take it on? Well, trust me, I did try to find a solution, a pre-existing solution, but I didn't. So I, I got so frustrated that I thought this ends now. Uh, well, what were the what were the needs? What were you looking for before you talk about what you built? What what was the driving need? Because there's a lot of things that out there that proclaim to do what you need this to do. Yeah, absolutely. So my initial uh, need was I was getting very frustrated, and it's not the client's fault, but I was getting very frustrated. Um, with them asking for uh, creative links. So once we finish a video, once we finish an ebook design or a cheat sheet or you know all of the creative assets that we do, uh, we would send those via Google Drive link or Dropbox link and and you know it was great in the short run, but you know some clients we've done over 2,000 assets and they have come you know people, uh, different people in the company, right? You you have change of employees and all of that stuff. So what was happening was the newer employees didn't know the assets that we had created and uh, to the right. point that they were claiming another agency did it. And that really bothered me. <laughs> <laughs> the hot mess between, oh, we can't find this asset. Can you send me the link? And that was very manual, wasting a lot of hours. Mm-hmm. And then the other part, which is, you know, people at the firms that we work at because they're slightly larger they just didn't know the assets that we created so I was thinking well wouldn't it be cool to have a digital asset manager that's simple that's not extremely exorbitantly expensive like current solutions and that obviously is is beautiful and that you're displaying your assets in the most beautiful way possible and so that's how eShelf came about that's our uh, minimum viable product but um you know with that same idea we want to automate a lot of other manual tasks that creative agencies are facing Mm -hmm. yeah because i mean you've got a crm built into this which is i mean honestly i think every SaaS product seems to have a crm built in but i can see the application for the type you're saying because like you said a lot of the companies you work for they're junior people they get promoted they leave for another company and they take that knowledge and relationship about products with them that's right it's a very it's a very fluid career let's put that a lot of movement between these companies exactly and we just always want to make sure that our agency gets the credit that it you know yeah and also from a practical standpoint that if down the line you know three employees down the line in our clients uh firm you know if if they need source files right because you know we're talking about back to the point of repurposing you know if you want to repurpose something that was done three years ago where are those source files that's another mess that people often forget you know all of the things that it took to build the asset we -hmm. have it very clean on eShelf we pair the end product say the, the the final video with the after effect files you can find that all grouped in one place Mm -hmm. It's nice and tidy. So if three years down the line, someone needs that, it's ready to go. And there's no Dropbox link or Google link to, you know. And they can do their version of it, right? If they need to update it, for example, like you said, they change the, and they don't have to go back and ping the person at your place and say, where's that file that we have? 
And it's yeah. all self-service from their standpoint. So so what's so how long has that been around? I mean, how I mean, is it relatively new or is this and I mean, was it something you were using internally and then you decided to turn Correct. it into a product? <laughs> Correct. So we we um gallery design studio was using a shelf since January 2022. As we started using it, we just our team realized that there were a lot of other manual things and a lot of things that our clients should have self-service access to, mm -hmm. um, such as reporting and you know, time management if it's relevant for that client. There's a lot of different things. And also uh, when you're running a creative agency, uh, similar to any honestly service business, there's a lot of different tools right. that you need to use. So you have maybe project management tools, uh, yeah. time tracking tools, you have all these bits and and then it just becomes too much so our ultimate goal is is to consolidate a little bit of the tools that creative agencies are are using honestly right. we want to be like the quick books for creative operations if that makes sense sure so, so so let's say for example i were to become a client of this and then i so i signed up for this so does it look like it's coming from my company so when my clients log in, it it's it's branded that way. Yes, we can do custom branding for our clients, our e shelf yeah. clients. Yeah. So it's not. I mean, it, it, e shelf is air quotes, but it's looking yeah. like. Correct. We, we put our logo at the bottom right. We do have to have some kind of. Yeah. But the focal point is to support our clients so that they can give the best experience possible to their teams and their clients. That is our ultimate goal. Well, that sounds pretty cool. I mean, I just, I just think from somebody who's worked with, with creative agency, I know that's a big issue, right? Because when you do have people moving around within a company or turnover issues or things like that, it's at least it's locked in. And, it's, and that person, that person can't really take the stuff with them either, right? Because they lose access. Correct. So, so that's from a, from a, from a IP standpoint, that seems like it's pretty desirable. Yep. So one of the big challenges with marketing is the entire uh, measurement aspect of it, you know, figuring out, okay, if I spend this much, my return on investment will be that much. How do you measure the effectiveness and the value of content marketing? Yeah. So I think, you know, my approach here is um, a little bit unique in the sense that yes, you need to be measuring quantitative data. So for example, what are your website visits or, you know, your landing page visits? Um, what is your click-through rate? How many uh, impressions are you getting on your social media posts? And really just keeping track of that week over week, month over month, so that you can course correct. I think that's absolutely critical. But there's another aspect that I think a lot of people undermine, uh, and it's the qualitative aspect of the value of content and you know just great marketing and brand visuals, right? Sure. Um, so, for example, we had a, a, a very good client of ours, and um, we absolutely love working with him. And he he told us, look, thanks to your great creative and content, you gave me the confidence to pitch to bigger and better clients. Okay. And so it's like, how do you put a price on that confidence, right? I right. mean, that's that's confidence can get you to a lot of places. So I think it's, mm -hmm. yes, look at the numbers, but also make sure that as you grow your business, set some investment, like some money aside to invest in your marketing and your branding, because this is an asset. And this is something that is not only going to build your business, but you as a person. Yeah, because that's something where I think people, when you look at like your balance sheet, right, you know, like you said, that's an asset, right, that you can grow and develop. And, and as your presence in the marketplace grows, right, that has more value to do different things, even if you're you know, a uh, retail store who's, you know, selling a product, but you've got a long history in the marketplace and you've served your people, your customers well. And that is something that builds up over time. A hundred percent. And it's also closely tied to first impressions, right? Mm -hmm. How people, the, the new market that you want to address, how are they perceiving you? And it's very difficult to rectify that first impression. So- right. Every single touch point matters. Now, obviously, when you're a small business, you can't boil the ocean, but you know, just keeping it in mind that as you grow, try right. to do your best to to show your best in every single touch point. Cool. So, where can someone go for more information about your two companies? You've got two companies. Talk about both of them. How can people get more information? 
Yeah, sure. So uh, if you want to find out more about our creative agency, we have a ton of free resources. So even if, you know, it's not a relevant service for you, I highly recommend you guys check us out, follow us. Um, sure. And that's at gallerydesignstudio.com. Mm -hmm. And then for our uh, new software that now it's finally going to be deployed to the wider public, not just us, uh, you can learn more at eshelf.io. So currently we have a wait list, but um, we will soon be launching. So stay tuned. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time and expertise. I've learned a lot and uh, best wishes for continued growth of both companies. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you for listening to the Dead Pixel Society podcast. Read more great stories and sign up for the newsletter at www.thedeadpixelssociety.com.